program proudly brought to you by the South Australian Tourism Commission. Another tribute to Colonel William Light, another Light Square. G'day, Keith Conlon. Welcome to Postcards in Gawler. The Jubilee 150 history of this area was called Colonel Light's Country Town. And today, we'll find out why. And as well, a whale of a time on the West Coast confounds the experts and the amazing rediscovery of one of Australia's great artistic talents. top of St George's Church on Church Hill in Gawley, you can see why Colonel Light chose this spot for a town. Just over there where the green hills are, the North Para River comes out from further back in the hills. And speaking of them, just over the ridge here, you might better see the range. And that's where Light was headed. He was off to do a country survey of the Barossa. Now on this side, where there's another gap in the green hills, that's where the South Para comes out and it forms a fork here. That was his spot for a town. He camped just along this way on the South Para at Dead Man's Pass, and that's another story. Things started happening pretty quickly after that. By March, he had laid out the town here, particularly the old part here, the Church Hill area. By June, it had been surveyed by his firm. By the end of the year, sadly, Light had died, but the town had been named after the second governor of South Australia, Governor George Gawler. That was all in 1839. So below is beautiful and very old Gawler the colonial Athens, the gateway to the north, a 19th century engineering marvel. We'll get on their excellent walking trail today. And Dead Man's Pass? Light camped at the South Para Ford. Actually, it was still a river crossing till the new works went in just a few weeks ago. And he followed up on a rumour that there was a dead body plastered with clay into a tree nearby. And there was. An early pioneer had been picked up by another group and he died on the back of their way, so they stuck him in a tree. Colonel Light found him and called the spot Dead Man's Pass. But now to one man's dream of a haven for endangered animals and a retreat for weary workers. There are few places left in South Australia where the eye can scan thick coastal Mallee scrub without interruption except for the occasional road or fire track. Flinders Chase National Park is one of them. Here the Mallee runs for miles and miles and it's largely due to the efforts of early conservationists like Samuel Dixon who spent much of his life in battle with various governments to save the western end of Kangaroo Island. The relentless search for new farming country had swallowed up much of the island by the turn of the century, and only the most committed could save scenes like this for all of us. the 1890s, governments didn't see the need for national parks. Dixon did. Dixon and others struggled for nearly three decades to have the western end of Kangaroo Island declared a national park. He saw this as essential to the preservation of our local flora and fauna, much of it having already been lost to wholesale land clearance. And he also saw it as essential to the preservation of our own sanity, describing this area as a potential sanitarium and playground for tired workers suffering from what he quaintly described as brain fag and other forms of overwork. For years, Dixon and other members of the Royal Society of South Australia had marvelled at the secrets of the western end of the island. Finally, in 1919, Samuel Dixon succeeded in having an initial parcel of 50,000 hectares of native scrub and timber country set aside by an Act of Parliament. He considered it a place for people to come to get away from their daily life as a bit of a sanctuary for those suffering from brain fag, as he put it. And it's a bit of a wildlife sanctuary it developed in that way where species were introduced that were considered to be under threat on the mainland. In many ways, Flitters Chase National Park has been an ongoing experiment, with endangered mainland animals transplanted here with varying degrees of success. The koala, once threatened by habitat destruction and hunting on the mainland, took to the K.I. gum trees with relish their increasing numbers causing a dilemma for conservationists and governments alike. Now many are being shipped back to the mainland in a move which Samuel Dixon would probably have approved. The koala is just one mainland animal to call Flinders Chase home. 
Cape Barren geese were introduced here early on, the platypus and emus were introduced to the park as well and they're all animals that you can see now when you come to visit the park as well as the species that occur here naturally like kangaroos and wallabies, seals, crimson rosellas. If you match Samuel Dixon's description of a brain-fagged worker, then Flinders Chase at the western end of KI is the ideal retreat. Entry into the park is $8 per vehicle. Colonel William Light's signature is on the only country town that he planned before he died later in the year of 1839. And like Adelaide, Gawler has parklands by the river and squares. This is one of three squares that Light designed, Orleana Square. In January 1839, three pioneer families of the town-to-be paddled ashore at Glenelg from the ship Orleana. They'd taken a long time to get here from England. And then the Reid family, for instance, took three days by dray to bring their possessions up here. Nowadays, of course, 40 kilometres, you can do it in less than an hour and be in this Church Hill district. In St George's there, there's a memorial window to Governor George Gawler. He was a war hero. He had led an infantry charge with Wellington at Waterloo. You see a fair few of the institutions that a town should have in the old Churchill section of Gore, but they reckon like Port Elizabeth can tell you can see it's very quiet and still. As with Lake, the action moved elsewhere. In Gawler's case, it all happened in Murray Street, where the town's reputation as the gateway to the north came true. And predictably, as you walk around Church Hill, you spot several churches, including this very distinctive brick and stone one. It's the Catholic Church, century old, the Church of St Peter and St Paul, and they each scored a tower. The historic Gawler walking trail takes you by the old Union flour mill, one of several back in the days when the town was surrounded by the granary of the province, and the remarkable polychromatic Tortola house with its double iron arches and its distinctive iron lace fence, all cast locally. Through the parklands on the South Parra, planted with Moreton Bay figs last century by young Dr Richard Schomburg, before he became the legendary director of the Botanic Garden in Adelaide. And on the trail you'll meet James Martin. Now, if Colonel Light planned the town, Martin certainly became the father of Gawler. He was born in poverty, interestingly on Foundry Road in a little place in Cornwall, and he, when he came to South Australia, brought all his possessions up here in one dray. But in a half a century, he saw Gawler turn from a bush hamlet into one of the largest and most picturesque country towns in Australia. That's what they said in his testimonial. And fair enough too, because he had quite a lot to do with it. Not a lot of it is left now, but his Phoenix foundry once covered 18 acres and gave jobs to 700 men. James Martin and company turned out literally thousands of Ridley wheat strippers and major mining machinery for Kalgoorlie's Golden Mile. And in December this year, it'll be exactly a century since he died and his funeral cortege stretched for a mile through the town. Now, within a few years, through depression and drought and the rise of the Islington Railway Workshops, his foundry empire was gone and Gawler entered a much quieter period for the next half a century. The signs of a premier and prosperous country town are all up and down Murray Street. Once, it was the narrow handle of a giant fan of travellers going anywhere and everywhere above Gawler on the map of South Australia. As you can see, it's still busy today. It's hard to believe that Gawler in the Victorian gold race was down to four or five men. But a lot of them came back with a pot of gold, and so soon this place developed the reputation as the colonial Athens. Now, if that sounds a bit over the top, that certainly would have attracted the ire of some people who used to gather over here, upstairs in the Kingsford Hotel. Maybe every new politician ought to come and pay tribute here because that was the home of the famous Humbug Society. They were there to fight humbug in all high places. In fact, their motto was flam, bam, sham. By 1863, the Gawler Printery was well established by Scotsman William Barnett and his family still running it. And it had put out the first edition of The Bunyip, a Gawler Humbug Society chronicle. And it's still going strong. Mind you, The Bunyip was supposed to strike terror into the hearts of any poo bar who is into hoo-ha. Instead, the first edition copped a defamation suit from a dignitary in town. Well, that's the lighter side of a town that also produced an anthem, the Song of Australia. More on that in a moment.
Scholar's commercial past is still on parade in Murray Street. Its first pub, the old spot, was once held up by bush rangers and it saw early bullockies through from the copper mines to the north. The old telegraph station, now a National Trust Museum, was built in 1859 as a sign of the early prosperity of the town. And the post office next door followed soon after. The telephone came to town 110 years ago. And here in Murray Street, the strands of history really create a rich tapestry right over here. On top of the town hall, for instance, the coat of arms of Governor Gawler, after whom the town was named in 1839. Then in that iron fence just across, across there, locally cast iron, of course, the industrial prosperity of Gawler shone through. It was given by the man himself, James Martin. And that is the Institute. Now that's the colonial Athens bit of Gawler. It was a sort of continuing festival of arts and education in its heyday, but its greatest contribution nationally was a national anthem of a kind. That's where the Song of Australia was born in a competition in 1859. And so, Carolyn Carlton, sitting in the West Terrace Cemetery, wrote the words and she asked the young German composer and conductor Carl Linger to write the melody and the rest is history. Well, not quite. Come this December, it'll be the 140th anniversary of the first ever rendition of the Song of Australia. And it was sung right there. So, all above was Asia Bright in Gawler last century. Now, they're very proud of the town and its modern face today and they'd be very pleased to hand you a brochure either in the Institute Library or in the Visitor Centre up where the Barossa Valley turn-off is.